Our church is a very wise mother because it prepares us for whatever we will be encountering in life. Today's gospel was about Zacchaeus. When you hear the gospel of Zacchaeus, what are you reminded of? What's coming? What? Before Easter. Lent. And the church not only has Lent as a preparation for Pascha for Easter, but it has pre-Lenten Sundays as a preparation for Lent, and it even has pre-pre-Lenten Sundays. And what is that first pre-pre-Lenten Sunday? Zacchaeus, always. When you hear the Gospel of Zacchaeus, get ready, because you know it's coming. And the Gospel of Zacchaeus is really a continuation of what I asked you last week. Do you remember what I asked you last week? <laughs> what were the first words of Christ that are recorded in Scripture? Why do you seek me? Because Zacchaeus is the gospel of desire. Zacchaeus, as an example now, was probably the worst of people. He was a tax collector. He worked for the Romans and defrauded the Jews. He was horrible. They hated tax collectors. Well, we all hate tax collectors. Right? <laughs> but in those days, there was no justice. They were their own bosses. But he wanted to see Jesus, and he climbed up in a tree because there were so many people he wanted to see. And when Jesus got to him, when he got to him at the tree, he said, Zacchaeus, come down because I'm coming to your house. You see, the Lord chooses us, but what do we have to have first? Faith. Desire. The desire to be with the Lord. Faith, yes. To be with the Lord. To want to seek him. Zacchaeus had some stirring in his heart that said, I want to see this man that I've heard so much about, who's doing all these miracles, who claims he's the Son of God. Let me see him. And because of that desire, the Lord picked him up and said, I'm coming to your house. And what do you think the priests and all the religious people said? Oh, what do you think? How could he go to the house of a sinner? And what did Jesus say? I came to save the lost, the sinners, not the faithful, not the righteous. He came to save us all. So, the church prepares us for Lent, through pre-Lenten and pre-pre-Lenten studies. And it's because the church is so concerned about us, because she knows, she, I can call her she because the church is like a mother, the church knows how much we hate Lent, how much we hate fasting, how much we hate to give up anything, how much we say, well, you can't eat meat, you can't eat eggs, you can't eat butter, you can't eat cheese, you can't eat yogurt, but that's your sense of living, you say. But the church is saying, listen, we're going to enter into a school, we're going to enter into a hospital, we're going to enter into higher education, because this is something that is going to prepare you for the greatest mystery of all time, the resurrection of the Lord, and to be able to accept it in your hearts, to be able to accept it. I think many times, you know, they say hindsight is 2020. You can't see forward, but when you look back, when you look back and you see how the Lord has acted in your life, you have to be very thankful. And I look back at my life, and I know my wife is going to get angry with me now. When I think of my past life and where I've come, I don't give myself the credit. I'm not saying, oh, how good I am now. I'm saying, how has the Lord acted in my life? What a sense of humor he has. What a sense of humor God has. He picked me up from that sycamore tree and said, okay. Now this is what's going to happen to you, not what you want. I had no idea. But for all of us, God has chosen something in our lives to bring us to a point where we
we never realized, but we never realized, if we open our hearts to him, if we desire, if we allow him to work in us, that he will bring us to that place that we never could have imagined, that we never could have imagined. And I'm in that place now. Who would have thought in my drinking days that I was going to be a priest? Huh? <laughs>
don't want to leave you with a warning, but I give you a warning. The scripture says, the gates of hell will never prevail against the church. But it doesn't say where. It doesn't say the gates of hell will never prevail against the church in Easton. It says that throughout the world it will not prevail, that the church will always exist. But it doesn't guarantee where it will exist. And when St. John wrote his epistle to the Revelation, the Revelations rather, not the epistle, the Apocalypse, he wrote to seven churches that were all in Asia Minor that no longer exist. That no longer exist. When we don't desire the Lord, when we don't want to be with Him, when we don't worship, when we're not part of the church, where we don't support the parish, where we are not faithful and worship, the Lord says, okay, if you don't want me, then I don't have to be there. And the church is wiped out. It can happen right here in the United States. We are under siege as Christians. And we've been for a long time. No prayers in church, no prayers in the public square, no prayers in this, no prayers that. Don't do this, you can't pray at graduation. And who gets the most persecution? The Christians. Why? Because it's Christianity and Christ that really make the difference in everybody's life. Do not give up your faith. If we're not gonna be allowed to pray outside, at least come here and pray and be faithful. Be faithful so that the church can exist forever and ever because this is the place where we attain our salvation. This is the place that saves us, that brings us to eternity to be with God. If we desire Him, if we seek Him, if we love Him, and if we try to live our lives the way He has described it for us, to love each other as much as we can, if we can. I know it's difficult. I know it's difficult. But if it weren't difficult, it wouldn't be a great feat. It's difficult, but He's asking us 